In a war that seemed certain to be lost, they brought America hope for victory. Across thousands of miles of Pacific Ocean and dozens of jungle islands occupied by an unrelenting enemy, they fought to the death. Their story is one of uncommon valor, a near mythic legend paid for with bravado, bayonets, and blood. Marine Raiders, next on Dangerous Missions. To hear their stories is to know the hell of war. To remember how they died is a solemn reminder of sacrifices made in the name of flag and country. In the space of about 30 seconds, we lost the first three fatalities in the Guadalcanal operation. Bayonet wound, left side, abdomen and lower chest, shrapnel wound, both legs, gunshot wound, the left leg. came through their lines, they actually looked at us as though we were seeing ghosts. For two ferocious years, from 1942 until 1944, a few thousand hand-picked, lightly armed Marines cut a swath of destruction on Pacific Islands behind enemy lines, across some of the most brutal killing fields ever seen in war. They are considered the first special forces unit in the history of the United States military. Highly trained commandos whose mission was to strike quickly, effectively, and get out. They were the Marine Raiders. We were able to kill you know, literally hundreds of Japanese and lose only you know, a, a fraction of that in Raiders. Been walking down a trail, you know, going through this another outfit. And uh, some little kid would look up and say, uh, hey, what outfit? You know, second Raiders. And you could almost see that. <laughs> Eyes got bigger and his mouth gaped open. <laughs> He's a little bit awed by it, I guess. <laughs> we, we walked a little taller. <laughs> the names of their remarkable campaigns, which turned back the onslaught by the Imperial Army of Japan and the Pacific, are etched in the lexicon of modern warfare. Macon Island, New Georgia, Guadalcanal, Bougainville. Their battle cry, Gung Ho, a Chinese term meaning work together, has become synonymous with the ability of a Marine's fighting spirit to overcome seemingly insurmountable odds. One thing that they, uh, that they have in common is they, uh, th these weren't people who wanted to be in the rear with the beer. These are guys who wanted to see action. They wanted to fight. Their tale is seldom told, and many of the images in this program have rarely been broadcast. Those pictures and films combined with History Channel reenactments will bring to life the story of the Marine Raiders. History remembers the four Raider battalions as extremely efficient fighting tools in an island war that was spinning out of control. But the genesis of the Marine Raiders did not come easy. Many regular Marine leaders at the time felt there was no need for a specialized unit, that the GIs themselves could handle even the most treacherous amphibious assaults. But in the dark days following Japan's near annihilation of the U.S. Navy's fleet at Pearl Harbor, the American public needed a victory. The nation's morale was low. Japanese forces were moving at will across the islands of the Pacific. In Europe, Nazi troops had pushed the British army off the continent, and Hitler's Germany controlled land stretching from the English Channel to Eastern Europe. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt turned to England for ideas. The president wanted to know what had helped the British people bravely face even the most hopeless of times. The answer was the British commandos. 
essence, the Raiders were the Marine Corps' version of the British Commandos. Back when the Raiders were being formed, American morale was at a very low point, and FDR had met with Churchill, and Churchill had kind of done a morale boost for the British, and FDR kind of liked that idea. Two people were instrumental in pushing Roosevelt toward forming an American version of the British Commandos. One was his son, Jimmy, a Marine himself, who believed that a commando fighting force would be effective in the South Pacific. The other was an old friend of the President's. He was a veteran officer who had fought with the Marines in Nicaragua and spent much of the 1930s in China, where he studied that country's commando forces. He would go on to become one of the Raiders' most enduring legends. His name was Evans F. Carlson. He had a set of ethics to this day I marvel at because they were so rigid. He had to consider the ethical implications of everything that he did. He felt that guerrilla warfare units could be filled with an esprit de corps, an esprit de mission that would make them want to give more than even a regular unit could do. With the permission of the president, Carlson and Marine Commander Merritt A. Edson, a veteran of the Banana Wars in Central America during the 1920s, began to recruit volunteers. Edson headed the 1st Raider Battalion at the Marine Base in Quantico, Virginia. Carlson's 2nd Battalion trained at Camp Elliott in San Diego, California. Both men made it clear to potential recruits that the Raiders would be a breed apart. Marine Raiders were all volunteers, and you might say they were volunteers for the second time because at that time the Marine Corps was not taking draftees. You had to volunteer for the Marine Corps, then you had to volunteer for the Raiders. They were a first in, last out outfit, supposedly. That was one of the things that intrigued me was the fact that we could get into the get into the war quicker. But just being physically fit and willing to fight did not guarantee being assigned to the Raiders. They were grilled, actually, on a number of sort of pop quiz type questions. And one of the pop questions was, how would you feel about killing a Jap with a knife? If you recoiled at the thought of that, well, then you weren't for them. William Lansford was a young Marine who heard about the Raider recruitment and wanted in. Refused permission by his commanding officer to volunteer, he snuck away from his unit to try and get an interview with Evans Carlson. He's sitting there at a little crappy table and he's writing something in a notebook. He said, what can I do for you? I said, I want to join the Raiders. And then he began asking me questions, you know, would you cut your buddy's throat if he was panicky behind the lines and stuff like that. It was fairly melodramatic stuff. And I answered what I thought he wanted to hear. The next day, Lansford became a raider. His three months of training went far beyond what the Marines had put soldiers through. Advanced weapons practice, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, demolitions, and intense physical training. Though these men were already hardened by basic training in the Marine Corps, training to become a raider was designed to hone their bodies as well as jungle fighting skills foreign to most American soldiers. The raiders were trained to use rubber boats to give them the ability to quickly and quietly reach island targets. And the raiders were essentially formed as shock troops and just to really throw an enemy in disarray, and uh, they were never trained to fight a defensive fight. It was always just hit hard, quick, and get out of there as fast as they could and cause as much damage as they could, which they did very well. We learned a lot about living off the land, and we, we could exist for a while with a, a sock full of rice and a piece of salt pork. You know, you'd be surprised how many meals you can get out of a sock full of rice. <laughs> By the spring of 1942, the first Raider units were ready to leave the safety of the United States for the dangerous waters of the South Pacific. The pressure on them to succeed was tremendous. Most of the U.S. military might was focused at the war in Europe, 
Pacific, Japanese troops were encountering little or no resistance as they moved from island to island on a vicious expansion eastward. America badly needed a victory. It was up to the raiders to give them one. By the summer of 1942, Marines and the Marine 1st and 2nd Raider Battalions had made their way to the South Pacific. Made up of 800 men each, the battalions set up training posts in Hawaii and Samoa. Often on these islands, more regular Marines volunteered to become Raiders. We were eating Australian mutton at Shawinus Camp as a replacement unit and a young lieutenant came down from the raider camp and asked if anybody wanted to volunteer. And uh, I dropped a piece of meat from my mess gear on the ground and the camp dog wouldn't eat it. And this lieutenant said, we're having steak at the raider camp. And I was about the third one at the coconut tree to sign up. That's how I became a raider. It was from these islands that the Marines would stage their assaults across the South Pacific. And it was on these islands that the raiders prepared for commando raids into the unforgiving jungle strongholds held by the Japanese. Though the two raider battalions trained for similar assignments, hit and run commando style missions, their leaders could not have been more different. Merritt Edson, commander of the 1st Raider Battalion, was a by-the-book Marine. A decorated war hero who had come of age fighting in Central America, he believed in protocol, proper decorum, and a strict adherence to Marine procedure. Edson, incidentally, was a uh, tremendous weapons expert, and he was captain of the Marine rifle and pistol team, which was no small deed at that time and at any time. And he was just an uh, all-around outstanding officer, and his uh, men would do anything for him. The leader of the Raiders 2nd Battalion, Evans Fordyce Carlson, also a veteran of World War I, was different. He was an individualist. Some called him a Mustang. He believed that if the Raiders were going to do extraordinary jobs, then they should be treated differently than other Marines. Some saw his men as more rebels than Marines. Carlson's raiders, as they would come to be known, often grew their hair long and had beards. We got there, there was a couple of guys with rubber boats and a lot of Jap equipment, and they were all wearing these big knives, and uh, they all looked, didn't look like Marines. They looked like uh, tramps, uh, beards, long hair, and so forth. Carlson employed tactics he learned in China and Nicaragua. He imported from China the phrase gung-ho, which translated meant work together. It was a term that would be forever associated with the Raiders. Carlson trained us so well, in my view, and in the view of others, too, that actually, far from being a suicide outfit, we were so well trained that, that we, I think we have fewer casualties than the average Marine unit did. I think the enemy is the one that had the big casualties when we met, not us, and I'm not boasting. During the months of arduous jungle training and later in the hell of battle, Carlson held gung-ho meetings where operational plans and objectives were discussed and every man in the raider unit could speak his mind regardless of rank. The troops could speak their minds and about anything and not really have any guilt about it or fear of reprisal. And it, it was a system that, that Carlson instilled in him. And his troops just loved him. They would have followed him uh, right over the edge. The well-being of, of his people always came ahead of his personal feelings or personal desires or, or personal situation. Always. Carlson knew that passion would be needed when his raiders stepped into the line of fire. Carlson also developed what, at the time, was an unorthodox approach to jungle warfare. The regular Marines used an eight-man formation when going into battle. Carlson used a 10-man team, 
one squad leader, and three fire teams of three men each. Each fire team had a Thompson submachine gun, a Browning automatic rifle, and one of the new Garand M1 semi-automatic rifles. Well, he thought that there was a serious need for an organization like this that was capable of operating independently and was heavily equipped with weapons so that the firepower was three or four times as great as one might expect from a um, battalion of similar size in, in, a, in a line regiment. In a three-man unit, you can see what the possibilities for firepower were, enormous. Carlson's son, who was also a Marine, wanted to follow his father into battle with the Raiders. But the senior Carlson at first wanted nothing to do with his son being beside him in war. I mentioned to my father a number of times, formally and informally, and verbally and in writing, of my desire to be a, a member of his outfit. And he, he said, go away and bother me, or words to that effect. The younger Carlson got into the Raiders with the help of the president's son, Jimmy Roosevelt, who would go on to command the 4th Raiders Battalion. Carlson loved photography, and many of the pictures seen in this program were taken by him or by the battalion's photographer. Many of the images have never before been seen. Though Carlson became symbolic with the romance of the Pacific War, it was Edson and his 1st Raiders Battalion that first saw action against the Japanese. It happened on August 7, 1942, on a small strategic piece of land located in the lower Solomon Islands called Tulagi, home to a Japanese seaplane base. Tulagi was known to be the hardest nut to crack as far as coming in because they had several hundred of what they called special landing force people that we would call Japanese Marines. They, they were well trained and uh, very, very bitter uh, fighters to the end. Tulagi was small, only 4,000 yards long and no more than 1,000 yards wide. When the raiders arrived, small skirmishes turned into major assaults. The 872 invading raiders found the only way to flush out the Japanese was to use explosives. That night, the Japanese countered with a classic bonsai bayonet attack. The enemy came within 50 yards of the raider command post, but Edson's raiders held on and ferociously fought back. By 3 p.m. the following day, Edson declared the island secure. The raiders suffered losses of 38 dead and 55 wounded. All but three of the 350 Japanese defenders were killed. The raiders proved themselves as capable fighters the first time in combat, but they would soon find out that victory against the Japanese would not always come easy, and sometimes not at all. In August 1942, Marine Raider units were mobilized in the South Pacific to make a statement. The United States public wanted heroes, and government officials believed the Raiders were their best shot. Nobody understood at that time, I think, just how hungry the American public was for some good war news. The 2nd Raiders Battalion, known for their commander as Carlson's Raiders, prepared to strike Macon Island, an atoll in the Gilbert Islands chain. Besides Carlson, the men were under the command of a lanky, quiet, and well-mannered officer, not necessarily the image of a fighting machine. But he came with the right pedigree. He was Jimmy Roosevelt, son of the president, one of the people responsible for the Raiders being formed in the first place. When Roosevelt was first commission a captain everybody made fun of him you know and and the other FDR sons you know they had bumper stickers I want to be a captain too daddy and all that but he was not only a very intelligent man and a very compassionate man but he was a terrific soldier as it turned out the planned raid on Macon Island would be more a decoy than an assault in reality the Marines were already on Guadalcanal 
the Japanese could be fooled into thinking another invasion would take place in the Gilbert Islands near Macon if the raiders attacked there. The raider plan was bold. Two companies from the raiders' 2nd Battalion boarded two mine-laying submarines, the Nautilus and the Argonaut. Under the command of Evans Carlson and Jimmy Roosevelt, the men set sail for six days. They sent 222 officers and men aboard those two submarines for this lightning strike raid on Macon Atoll to kill the enemy, destroy all their provisions, their avgas, their radio station, the seaplanes, anything they had. Under the cloak of darkness, the raiders quietly launched their attack on Macon Island on August 17, 1942. The plan was to come ashore in rubber boats at two separate points on the island. But due to poor weather conditions, the plan was scrapped. The boats all wound up at the same place. Things got worse. The Japanese were unaware of the raiders' arrival until one of the raiders accidentally discharged his weapon. The element of surprise was over. The battle for Macon was on. Here you have the Macon Island Raid, which is as colorful a raid as even Hollywood could envision with uh, submarines and rubber boats at night and breaching the surf and uh, high firepower. During the first few minutes of the firefight, Sergeant Clyde Thomason died while directing the fire of his platoon. He was later awarded the Medal of Honor, the first enlisted Marine so decorated in World War II. The Japanese launched a series of bonsai attacks. I moved in there and there was this machine gun set up and both the gunners were dead and my curiosity got better, my better judgment, I guess, and I got on my knees, I was looking one of them over and uh, just about that time he raised us up on his knees. <laughs> <laughs> so I fortunately had a knife in my pick, so I whipped this out and surgically installed him a new air passage into his lungs. The fight appeared to go badly for the raiders. Carlson ordered a withdrawal back to the rubber boats, but high surf prevented many of the men from getting more than 50 yards offshore. The faulty outboard engines, which Carlson had wanted replaced, swamped. Boats overturned and equipment disappeared. Some of the raiders drowned. More raiders died on Macon Island that should have died. Had nothing to do with Carlson. It had to do with the damn motors that they had on those rubber boats. And Carlson had complained for months that when you got into a high surf, that these motors tended to swamp. And he said, if they swamp at the wrong time, when we're loaded down with gear and everything, he said, the men have to paddle out of there. Because of the rough surf, the men were forced back to the island. The following day, concerned there were still overwhelming numbers of Japanese soldiers in the jungles of Macon, many of the raiders felt they had reached a spiritual low. Carlson sent two scouts into the jungle to patrol. They returned an hour later with remarkable news. It turned out that the raiders had been much more successful than they thought. They had killed most of the Japanese. The ones who survived had fled. Carlson ordered the 18 raiders killed on Macon to be buried. He then sent the rest of his men into the boats and they paddled to the safety of the waiting submarines. What the raiders didn't realize was that in the confusion of battle, nine raiders had become separated from the group and were lost somewhere on Macon or in one of the surrounding atolls. They didn't realize until they got back to Hawaii that these nine guys were left on the island. And Carlson said to me, he said, if I'd have known there was one man left, he said, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gone back to the submarine. I would have stayed with them. The nine left on Macon were taken to Kwajalein Island and beheaded. When the two submarines carrying the raiders sailed into Pearl Harbor, the men on board were amazed. We were surprised as we were going down Battleship Row there. The Navy had all their crews aft, and the band was playing the Marine hymn. And up ahead on the pier was the big Marine Honor Guard, present arms, and there was all the Navy brass in, uh, in Honolulu. So we, we 
began to realize that, good God, we're, we're a bunch of heroes. <laughs> Though Carlson was deeply disturbed by what he considered an unnecessary loss of American lives on Macon, especially because of the poor performance of the outboard motors on the rubber boats, the public thought otherwise. The Raiders had soundly beaten the Japanese in the Pacific. In an interview given during the war, Carlson focused on the bravery of his men in battle. Our casualties were very light by comparison with the enemy. They were light because the Raiders worked together, cooperating fully. Each man and officer knowing his part of a job and doing it with the unspoken assurance that his comrades would be where they were supposed to be, when they were supposed to be, and doing what they were supposed to do. The next ordeal was just weeks away. It would test the mettle of even seasoned combat veterans. The Raiders were about to be thrust into the most hellish series of battles they would ever face, the violent firefights for control of an island known as Guadalcanal. During August 1942, the stage was set for one of the fiercest battles of World War II. It would come on a lonely island, a seemingly insignificant piece of land called Guadalcanal. It was here that the Marines and the Marine Raiders made a stand to protect a pockmarked dirt landing strip. It was a symbol of hope. It was the Marines' connection to the outside world. It was called Henderson Field. If the Japanese controlled it, could make Americans' attempts to recapture all those other islands very, very difficult. Americans controlled it. They had a, a staging point for all kinds of missions and supplies, so it was critical. Throughout the month of August, the American Navy moved as many Marines as possible onto Guadalcanal. But the Japanese Navy had other plans for this remote outpost. On August 8th, ships from the Japanese Imperial Navy quietly maneuvered past a half dozen Allied warships, both American and Australian, into what today is known as Iron Bottom Sound. The surprise attack that followed was one of the greatest Allied naval losses of the war. Four cruisers were sunk outright, a fifth damaged beyond repair. More than 1,000 Allied sailors lost their lives. And Guadalcanal was now without naval support. The Japanese began unloading troops and supplies unfettered in plain sight of the Marines stationed in the coastal plain. Their target was Henderson Field. To control the airstrip meant control of the island and a quick end to the fighting. It was up to the 800 men in the first raiders led by Merritt Edson to stop a surge of 3,000 Japanese troops before they reached Henderson. To prepare for the attack, Edson chose a knife-shaped ridge above Henderson Field on which to position his troops. From here, he would make one of the most famous stands of the war. We were going to this rest area, which uh, was right at the ridge that was pointing right at uh, Henderson Field. It was a long, low, serpentine type of ridge with kunai grass, waist or chest high, sharp as needles, uh, surrounded by jungle. At 11 p.m. on September 12, 1942, Japanese planes dropped green flares over the raiders' perimeter. Minutes later, Japanese troops poured out of the darkened jungle. Greatly outnumbered and almost certain to be overrun, Edson ordered his men to retreat to a fallback position on top of the ridge. Raiders bunkered down in foxholes. Enemy machine guns and rifle fire came in from seemingly all directions. Many of the Raiders were near the breaking point, but Edson stood firm. He supposedly told them, you're all Marines, get up on this ridge and fight held off several bonsai attacks, the Japanese, and in between times, in between the attacks, they spent their time digging huge foxholes, which protected them from the Japanese artillery fire, and ultimately saved the day for them. 
By morning, when the smoke had cleared, the raiders still controlled Henderson Field. During the battle, they had lost 138 men. The Marines' 1st Parachute Battalion lost 128. A total of 700 Japanese were dead. Another 500 who were wounded but later escaped died in the jungle. The hilltop where the raiders made this valiant final stand was given a name after their leader. It became known as Edson's Bloody Ridge. The Raider uh, Battle of the Ridge was a defining moment for the campaign. They had other big battles over that same ground, one big one anyway, later on, but they had the manpower then and the support that they didn't have when we were there. Though the fight for Henderson Field was over, the battle for Guadalcanal was not. Japanese troops still patrolled the jungle and another offensive was making its way west to engage poorly supplied Allied soldiers. The Marines sent Evans Carlson and his 800-man 2nd Raider Battalion behind enemy lines to seek out and destroy the advancing Japanese column. The 31-day mission, one of the longest in military history, was called the Long Patrol. somewhere around six or 700 Japanese, tore up some long-range guns and so forth, and uh, lost 16 men. They were behind the Jap lines on Guadalcanal for 30 days. And I'd say, I'd say that was the classic. Brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat in the jungle was a daily occurrence. We were able to kill literally hundreds of Japanese and lose only a, a fraction of that and raiders. And one time, I think we knocked off about 50 of them at Asamana, and we lost three raiders. But uh, the odds were always that way. You know, they, the, the Japanese, the Japanese were not, they, they didn't expect that Americans would be able to do that. Despite the success in battle, living conditions on the long patrol were beyond miserable. We lived, literally lived on rice, and tea and a little bit of bacon occasionally. That was our whole diet during that period. Despite the hardships, Carlson's long patrol was a success. Thought to be the longest of its type in World War II, it resulted in 448 enemy killed. The Raiders lost 16 men and had 18 wounded. And we were able to hit them and then disappear into the jungle which must have called the Japanese because they were supposed to be the great jungle fighters. The result was that after 30 days of following and hitting these poor guys, the regiment ceased to exist. When it arrived at its destination, it was useless. And my understanding is that the colonel burned his flag and shot himself, and that was the end of that effort. The victory was especially sweet for Evans Carlson and his son, who had disobeyed his father and fought alongside him in the bloody battle for Guadalcanal. But the raiders would soon find out that their heroic status, paid for with so much blood, would be tragically short-lived. The days of the raiders were coming to an end. Following the hard-fought victory at Guadalcanal, the U.S. Marine Raiders continued to push across the Pacific. One of the most deadly battles came at a place called New Georgia Island. The 4th Raiders Battalion attacked Japanese outposts. Heavy losses were sustained on both sides. For the 4th Raiders Battalion, the battle would always be known as the Baptism of Fire. The fighting was intense. Raiders were sent into battle without adequate air cover and were outnumbered by the Japanese troops. We went in without any artillery, without any 80 millimeter, no air that didn't materialize. And I don't know why the ships never fired in their support. 
but we made the attack and that we couldn't do it. We had to back off. That's the only time I think that we didn't get our objective. And that was kind of the story of New Georgia. One of the last campaigns for the Raiders came early in 1944 at an island called Bougainville. Well, Bougainville was, uh, was flat in the, in the jungle almost immediately from the beach on. Within a short period of time, it was swamped. Uh, and uh, it was a, a dense growth, a complete swampy. Part of the swamp you couldn't get through at all. No one fought over that particular piece of ground. The rest of it was completely mud. Foxholes were all full of water because they were, they were actually in the swamp. Uh, and uh, this is the way we went through this thing. Though the Japanese were on the run, they were not going to give up Bougainville without a fight. We got on the beach and the Japanese planes around, they were strafing us off and on. And uh, it was just push, push, push. About all I can say about it, because whatever the people said do, we did. And we just kept moving. The second and third Raiders battalions of 800 men each fought on, despite casualties. The round, I think it was a sniper, it went to the guy's canteen next to me and then went into my leg. If it hadn't, I probably had some serious injuries, but I never came off the line on that, and I limped for a while. But Corman pulled a slug out of my leg and put some sulfur powder on it, and we went on. <laughs> By January 1944, the battle for Bougainville was over. The Japanese army retreated. But fighting in the Pacific was no longer a raider game. Instead of small insurgency groups, the military needed large invasion forces. The days of the raiders were over. They were folded back into the ranks of the regular Marine Corps, and many fought at Okinawa and Iwo Jima. In fact, Mike Strank, a member of the Second Raiders, was one of the six men who raised the American flag on Iwo Jima. The prevailing thought held before the formation of the Raiders that every Marine, in essence, could be a Raider, that they didn't need to have these separate organizations, but what they needed are people to be trained for special operations. Um, as these operations came up, kind of led them to believe that we need to go back to the idea that you don't need an elite unit within an elite unit. Evans Carlson, the leader of the Raiders' 2nd Battalion, lost his command. After leaving the Raiders, he went on to fight in three Marine campaigns, Tarawa, Kwajalein, and Saipan. He was severely wounded on Saipan while rescuing his radio man, but returned to duty and served for the rest of the war. The high command finally got Carlson. They took the Raiders away from him. They made a staff officer out of him, an observer. To the best of my knowledge, he never received a command of his own ever again. Oh, they pinned another Navy cross on him, you know. They gave him medals, but they didn't give him the thing that he wanted the most, and that was what he used to call my Raiders, you know, my boys. So they had a short two-year history, but they blazed a lot of glory in those two years. Carlson retired in 1946 at the rank of Brigadier General U.S. Marine Corps. He died in 1947 and is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. At the Marine Raiders Museum in Richmond, Virginia, Thousands of artifacts from the Raider glory days are on display. Guns that blazed across the Pacific. Hundreds of photos of the Raiders in action. And the knives that the men who wore the distinctive Raider patch used to clear jungle path and kill the enemy. But perhaps the part of the museum that brings the most pride is the honor roll doors created by a raider which lists the names of all 8,000 raiders. For the raiders veterans their record of service speaks for itself. Eight percent of all of the medals of honor won by marines in World War II were won by marine raiders. Now these ne were not necessarily men who were marine raiders at the time they won the medal of honor. They might have been with the new 4th Regiment or with the 6th Marine, Marine Division. You find that 12% of the Navy crosses 
which is second to the Medal of Honor, were won by Marine Raiders. And you find that 8% of the Silver Stars were won by men who were at the time, or who had served earlier, as Marine Raiders. So the statistics show that these were a pretty brave group of guys who loved to fight. Today, the Raider legacy lives on in the military. Many of the tactics used by elite units like the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets, and Marine Force Recon units can be directly traced to the Raiders. I was at a reunion here in San Diego and we went up to Pendleton and the recon outfit put on a show for us. And I'll never get standing with about 50 of these Raiders and their eyes are this big. And here these modern day Marines come in dangling from helicopters on these ropes doing about 80 miles an hour, 1,500 feet in the air. So one, one guy looked at me and he says, my God, I wouldn't have done that for all the tea in China. And all these kids were just looking up to them like, uh, you know, it's heroes, which they are. The Raiders said it is their spirit, their gung-ho beliefs that keeps their bond strong, even in death. William Lansford first got to know many of his closest friends in the Raiders 2nd Battalion. When his good friend Al Flores was dying of cancer, the Raider glory days is all they talked about. Lying there in bed with his tubes and all that, and reliving the old days. And he, and he said, do you remember when we did this? Remember how we went through the lines? He said, you remember when you had to go back and I took you through the Japanese lines? and the, yeah, I, I remember. And then he, he took my arm like this and he said, we must have been crazy, Bill. And then he turned and said to my wife, we must have been crazy. Yeah. He died two days later. During the late 1990s, the Marine Corps began searching for the bodies of fallen soldiers in the Pacific. Amazingly, 19 remains of the Raiders killed on Macon Island were found. Natives had assisted Carlson's raiders to bury the men following the battle. And it was one of these locals, now an old man, who helped the U.S. military locate the site of the mass grave. Uh, lo and behold, 57 years later, that's where they were. And uh, it was about, I think, about 50 meters from where he said it was. And they recovered every one of them. They also recovered uh, 54 live Mark II fragmentation hand grenades. Uh, several weapons. They were all buried with their helmets on. The remains were taken to Arlington National Cemetery, where they were buried with full military honors. Perhaps the spirit of the Marine Raiders is best summed up by one of their greatest leaders, Colonel Evans Carlson. In a wartime interview, he talked about what it meant to be a Raider. Remember, only those who worked and sacrificed for the preservation of democracy are entitled to enjoy its benefits. If you are all out in this war, you may know that you are gung-ho with the men who are fighting so magnificently, moving ever nearer to the last victorious day of the war. They are making their contributions. You make yours. Together, we go on towards peace. Comrades all, working together, truly gung-ho. Gung-ho, a Chinese term meaning work together, has become synonymous with the ability of a Marine's fighting spirit to overcome seemingly insurmountable odds. One thing that they, uh, that they have in common is they, uh, th these weren't people who wanted to be in the rear with the beer. These are guys who wanted to see action. They wanted to fight. 
Their tale is seldom told, and many of the images in this program have rarely been broadcast. Those pictures and films combined with History Channel reenactments will bring to life the story of the Marine Raiders. History remembers the four Raider battalions as extremely efficient fighting tools in an island war that was spinning out of control. But the genesis of the Marine Raiders did not come easy. Many regular Marine leaders at the time felt there was no need for a specialized unit, that the GIs themselves could handle even the most treacherous amphibious assaults. But in the dark days following Japan's near annihilation of the U.S. Navy's fleet at Pearl Harbor, the American public needed a victory. The nation's morale was low. Japanese forces were moving at will across the islands of the Pacific. In Europe, Nazi troops had pushed the British army off the continent, and Hitler's Germany controlled land stretching from the English Channel to Eastern Europe. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt turned to England for ideas. The president wanted to know what had helped the British people bravely face even the most hopeless of times. The answer was the British commandos. In essence, the Raiders were the Marine Corps' version of the British commandos. Back when the Raiders were being formed, American morale was at a very low point, and FDR had met with Churchill, and Churchill had kind of done a morale boost for the British. And FDR kind of liked that idea. Two people were instrumental in pushing Roosevelt toward forming an American version of the British commandos. One was his son, Jimmy a Marine himself, who believed that a commando fighting force would be effective in the South Pacific. The other was an old friend of the President's. He was a veteran officer who had fought with the Marines in Nicaragua and spent much of the 1930s in China, where he studied that country's commando forces. He would go on to become one of the Raiders' most enduring legends. His name was Evans F. Carlson. He had a set of ethics to this day I marvel at because they were so rigid. He had to consider the ethical implications of everything that he did. He felt it, which they did very well. We learned a lot about living off the land. And we, we could exist for a while with a, a sock full of rice and a piece of salt pork. You know, you'd be surprised how many meals you can get out of a sock full of rice. <laughs> By the spring of 1942, the first Raider units were ready to leave the safety of the United States for the dangerous waters of the South Pacific. The pressure on them to succeed was tremendous. Most of the U.S. military might was focused at the war in Europe. In the Pacific, Japanese troops were encountering little or no resistance as they moved from island to island on a vicious expansion eastward. America badly needed a victory. It was up to the Raiders to give them one. By the summer of 1942, Marines and the Marine 1st and 2nd Raider Battalions had made their way to the South Pacific. Made up of 800 men each, the battalions set up training posts in Hawaii and Samoa. Often on these islands, more regular Marines volunteered to become raiders. We were eating Australian mutton at Chow in this camp as a replacement unit, and a young lieutenant came down from the raider camp and asked if anybody wanted to volunteer. And uh, I dropped a piece of meat from my mess gear on the ground, and the camp dog wouldn't eat it. And this lieutenant said, we're having steak at the Raider camp. And I was about the third one at the coconut tree to sign up. That's how I became a Raider. It was from these islands that the Marines would stage their assaults across the South Pacific. And it was on these islands that the Raiders prepared for commando raids into the unforgiving jungle strongholds held by the Japanese. 
Though the two raider battalions trained for similar assignments, hit-and-run commando-style missions, their leaders could not have been more different. Merritt Edson, commander of the 1st Raider Battalion, was a by-the-book Marine. A decorated war hero who had come of age fighting in Central America, he believed in protocol, proper decorum, and a strict adherence to Marine procedure. Edson, incidentally, was a uh, tremendous weapons expert, and he was captain of the Marine rifle and pistol team, which was no small deed at that time and at any time. And he was just a uh, all-around outstanding officer, and his uh, men would do anything for him. The leader of the Raiders' second battalion, Evans Fordyce Carlson, also a veteran of World War I, was different. He was an individualist. Some called him a Mustang. He believed that if the Raiders were going to do extraordinary jobs, felt that guerrilla warfare units could be filled with an esprit de corps, an esprit de mission, that would make them want to give more than even a regular unit could do. With the permission of the president, Carlson and Marine Commander Merritt A. Edson, a veteran of the Banana Wars in Central America during the 1920s, began to recruit volunteers. Edson headed the 1st Raider Battalion at the Marine Base in Quantico, Virginia. Carlson's 2nd Battalion trained at Camp Elliott in San Diego, California. Both men made it clear to potential recruits that the Raiders would be a breed apart. Marine Raiders were all volunteers, and you might say they were volunteers for the second time because at that time the Marine Corps was not taking draftees. You had to volunteer for the Marine Corps, then you had to volunteer for the Raiders. They were a first in, last out outfit, supposedly. That was one of the things that intrigued me was the fact that we could get into the get into the war quicker. But just being physically fit and willing to fight did not guarantee being assigned to the Raiders. They were grilled, actually, on a number of sort of pop quiz type questions. And one of the pop questions was, how would you feel about killing a Jap with a knife? If you recoiled at the thought of that, well, then you weren't for them. William Lansford was a young Marine who heard about the Raider recruitment and wanted in. Refused permission by his commanding officer to volunteer, he snuck away from his unit to try and get an interview with Evans Carlson. He's sitting there at a little crappy table and he's writing something in a notebook. He said, what can I do for you? I said, I want to join the Raiders. And then he began asking me questions, you know, would you cut your buddy's throat if he was panicky behind the lines and stuff like that. It is fairly melodramatic stuff. And I answered what I thought he wanted to hear. The next day, Lansford became a raider. His three months of training went far beyond what the Marines had put soldiers through. Advanced weapons practice, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, demolitions, and intense physical training. Though these men were already hardened by basic training in the Marine Corps, training to become a raider was designed to hone their bodies as well as jungle fighting skills foreign to most American soldiers. The raiders were trained to use rubber boats to give them the ability to quickly and quietly reach island targets. And the raiders were essentially formed as shock troops and just to really throw an enemy in disarray, and uh, they were never trained to fight a defensive fight. It was always just hit hard, quick, and get out of there as fast as they could, and cause as much damage as they In a war that seems certain to be lost, they brought America hope for victory. Across thousands of miles of Pacific Ocean and dozens of jungle islands occupied by an unrelenting enemy, they fought to the death. Their story is one of uncommon valor, a near-mythic legend paid for with bravado, bayonets, and blood. Marine Raiders, next on Dangerous Missions.
To hear their stories is to know the hell of war. To remember how they died is a solemn reminder of sacrifices made in the name of flag and country. In the space of about 30 seconds, we lost the first three fatalities in the Guadalcanal operation. Bayonet wound, left side, abdomen and lower chest, shrapnel wound, both legs, gunshot wound to left leg. When we came through their lines, they actually looked at us as they were seeing ghosts. For two ferocious years, from 1942 until 1944, a few thousand hand-picked, lightly armed Marines cut a swath of destruction on Pacific Islands behind enemy lines across some of the most brutal killing fields ever seen in war. They are considered the first special forces unit in the history of the United States military. Highly trained commandos whose mission was to strike quickly, effectively, and get out. They were the Marine Raiders. We were able to kill you know, literally hundreds of Japanese and lose only you know, a, a fraction of that in Raiders. Been walking down the trail, you know, going through this another outfit, and uh, some little kid would look up and say, uh, hey, what outfit? You know, second Raiders. And you could almost see that. <laughs> Eyes got bigger and his mouth gaped open. <laughs> He's a little bit awed by it, I guess. <laughs> we, we walked a little taller. The names of their remarkable campaigns, which turned back the onslaught by the Imperial Army of Japan and the Pacific, are etched in the lexicon of modern warfare. Macon Island, New Georgia, Guadalcanal, Bougainville. Their battle cry, then they should be treated differently than other Marines. Some saw his men as more rebels than Marines. Carlson's Raiders, as they would come to be known, often grew their hair long and had beards. We got there, there was a couple of guys with rubber boats and a lot of Jap equipment, and they were all wearing these big knives, and uh, they all looked, didn't look like Marines, they looked like uh, tramps, uh, beards, long hair, and so forth. Carlson employed tactics he learned in China and Nicaragua. He imported from China the phrase gung ho, which translated meant work together. It was a term that would be forever associated with the Raiders. Carlson trained us so well, in my view, and in the view of others too, that actually, far from being a suicide outfit, we were so well trained that, that we, I think we have fewer casualties than the average Marine unit did. I think the enemy is the one that had the big casualties when we met, not us, and I'm not boasting. During the months of arduous jungle training and later in the hell of battle, Carlson held gung-ho meetings where operational plans and objectives were discussed, and every man in the Raider unit could speak his mind, regardless of rank. The troops could speak their minds and about anything and not really have any guilt about it or fear of reprisal. And it, it was a system that, that Carlson instilled in him. And his troops just loved him. They'd have followed him uh, right over the edge. The well-being of, of his people always came ahead of his personal feelings or personal desires or, or personal situations. Always. Carlson knew that passion would be needed when his raiders stepped into the line of fire. Carlson also developed what, at the time, was an unorthodox approach to jungle warfare. The regular Marines used an eight-man formation when going into battle. Carlson used a 10-man team, one squad leader, and three fire teams of three men each. Each fire team had a Thompson submachine gun, a Browning automatic rifle, and one of the new Garand M1 semi-automatic rifles. Well, he thought that there was a serious need for an organization like this that was capable of operating independently and was heavily equipped with weapons so that the firepower was 
three or four times as great as one might expect from a um, battalion of similar size in, in, a, in a line regiment. In a three-man unit, you can see what the possibilities for firepower were. Enormous. Carlson's son, who was also a Marine, wanted to follow his father into battle with the Raiders. <laughs> 